was lonely Tended to dwell hand in hand I chose to be a one man stand Oh, your love I've forsaken It's part of the plan Oh, I'm mistaken Father, hear my cry and plea. Take me out of this earth, just reclaim me. Oh, I'm done with the man I'm seeing. And I choose Jesus to be woven in the dark. Oh, this righteous How's everybody doing? Would you go ahead and stand with me, please? I'm going to pray, and we're going to continue to worship God through singing. Father, you are amazing and wonderful. God, you are holy and righteous, and we are so excited to be gathered here today. As one body, as one mind, as one spirit, Father, to sing of your goodness. May you be glorified and honored in this place and in our everyday lives. We love you, and it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Us from 
Father, we sing hallelujah. We gather with the saints and angels around your throne right now. And we lavish praise 
and adoration. For you are worthy of it all. Lord, would you be lifted high and glorified in this place. Far above melodies, far beyond musical notes. Would you be magnified and lifted high in our hearts, Lord, and in our lives. Lord, we love you.
for your glory be lifted high. Sing it to him. Lift him up. Lift it high. Be lifted high. Lord, for your glory be lifted high. Be lifted high. Be lifted high. For your glory be lifted high, be lifted high, be lifted high. For your glory be lifted high. He's the everlasting Father. You're the everlasting Father. You're the all-consuming fire. You're the reason why. Good morning. Who else is thankful that we get to worship the one and true King Jesus this morning? The one who defeated death, the one who defeated hell. Amen. Hey, in just a moment, I'm going to invite you to partake in communion with us. There's uh, stations all around the sanctuary here. You're welcome to go with your friends. You're welcome to go with your family or a complete stranger and give thanks. And uh, let's remember what Jesus has done for us. So let me pray and we'll do that. Lord Jesus, we thank you so much for this, this morning. We thank you for the opportunity to come and praise and worship you. We thank you for the sacrifice that you've made for us. We thank you for your body that was broken and your blood that was poured out to cover our sins. And not only for us, Lord, but for anyone who would trust in you. And Lord uh, Jesus, we ask all of these things in your perfect name. Amen.
stand and worship. Father, that is our prayer as we come together now in this moment, in this time, to declare that you and you alone are worthy. This time of worship is not about us. It is about you. We declare that you are great and awesome and powerful in every way. And so, Father, we pray that you will work in our hearts and in our minds. That when we leave here today, we will be different than when we came in. That you will transform us as you change the way that we think. And so I praise you for hearing our prayer and allowing the storm to pass. Pray that the storms of life, that people bring pain and trauma into through today, I pray that those are healed as well. That you clear the path, that you open up our eyes to see that you are there and moving beautiful and powerful creator of all things. And so thank you for giving us freedom that we can worship together here, now. We praise you for this in Jesus' name. You can have a seat. It was C.S. Lewis in his book, Mere Christianity, which I freely admit I had to read at least twice to begin to even remotely understand the book. It's amazing, though, once you kind of have those aha moments, but plan to read it twice. You should read it. It's a great book. But in his book, Mere Christianity, he has one quote that stands out to me, at least for today and what we're thinking, and that is this, that every faculty you have. Your power of thinking or of moving your limbs from moment to moment is given to you by God. If you devoted every moment of your entire life exclusively to his service, you could not give him anything that was not, in a sense, already his. You see, when we begin to understand who God is, we begin to understand that he is creator, that he is sustainer of all things that are living, but he is also the giver. And here's the thing, God owns everything. God actually is the owner. So think for a moment, if you will, then, if God owns everything, maybe we can do a little mental exercise here, and that is in your own individual lives, what would be the most magnificent gift out of all the world that you could receive right now? What would be that great gift? Nothing is too expensive. Nothing is impossible. What's the very very best thing that man or God could give to you? Now, we probably don't need to take a lot of time to wait for that answer. I'm guessing you've probably thought about that before. In a perfect world, this is what I would get. This is what I would love. This is the most amazing thing ever. And so we probably already have that in our minds. So now let's ask the question, what would you do with that? Who besides you would benefit from it? What in the world would change by it? How is God's name glorified? And would his kingdom be expanded or just your own? These are important questions that we begin to ask about things like this. Here's ultimately what I mean. If you were to say in that moment, the most magnificent gift ever that I would receive would be a jumbo jet 747. That would be great. I would love a 747. Maybe that was one of yours in here. And so the question then would be, what would you do with that? Would you use it to just go vacation whenever you want to, to fly anywhere you want to, you and 500 of your friends? Or would you use it to fly missionaries in and out of different parts of the world? You see, how we would use a gift like that matters. Before you think about that any further, let me also just say that if you were to have that 747, understand that it uses a gallon of fuel every second And so on a 10-hour trip, you would use about 36,000 gallons of fuel, which is roughly $150,000. So if you ask for the jumbo jet, you should probably also ask for $1 million, that kind of thing, that you would want a million bucks. And maybe that was what it was for you, that I would really like a million bucks. That would be great. But again, the question would be, how would you use it? What would you do with it? Would it be used as a tool to buy a bunch more stuff 
Or could we build 300 water wells in Africa? You see, what we do with the gifts that God gives us matters. Where your treasure is, your heart will be there also. Matthew 6.21 makes that very clear. But I will turn that around and say it the other way. And that is that where your heart is, is where you will invest your treasures and your time and your talents. It is where your heart is that draws us into something else. And this is important that we begin to understand where's our heart. Where's our heart in all of these things? Now, let me just say, none of that, talking about the jumbo jet or million bucks or whatever, and how would we use that? It's not a Jesus juke. It's not intended to make you feel bad or make you feel like your, quote, your motives are being questioned. That's really not the intent whatsoever. The real issue is, what gifts has God already given you? And how are you using those? How do we utilize the things that God has given us? And so let's practice this for a moment. First of all, we would need to make sure that we know what the gifts are that God's given us. So I'm going to give you 30 seconds. Here in just a second, I'm going to stop, and we're going to actually take 30 seconds of silence. And I want you to either write it down in your phone, maybe on a note, or you can, on the back of the bulletin, write down 10 things that you know that God has given you. What are the 10 gifts that you've received? Can you do 10 in 30 seconds? Um, and I'm giving you some ramp-up time so you can be thinking about it. If you're really good, you can keep all 10 of them straight in your head, although most of us can only keep seven things in order in our brain. But maybe you could do 10. And so here we go. You've got 30 seconds. Write down or come up with 10 gifts that you know that God has given you. Start now. You know, for a lot of people, 30 seconds, it's hard to come up with 10. Uh, maybe you ch were challenged by that. Maybe you even feel a little weird about, like, how could I not come up with 10 gifts that I know I've received from God in 30 seconds? But sometimes they're elusive, and we don't always see. Ultimately, though, whatever you have written down, the question is, again, who ultimately benefits from these things? What in the world is changed by them? How is God's name glorified by what you already have? And how is his kingdom expanded? The truth is that we have all been given extraordinary things. Every one of us in the room. Every one of us has ex received extraordinary resources, abilities, knowledge, time, talents, and treasures. Every one of us have been given these amazing things, even though a lot of us in the room, probably when you see that God's given you time, talents, and treasures, we laugh. Because the truth is, most of us have no margin in our life whatsoever for time or treasures. We've spent all the money already. I have no time whatsoever. I don't even sleep enough. And so how could I use those things? Because I'm already stretched too thin. And most people think they don't have anything to offer to anyone else, which is a lie from the devil, by the way. If you're a Christian, you have been given gifts in order to expand the kingdom of God. So the question is, how are we using the things that we already have to impact the world around us? We've all been given these kinds of gifts. How do we use those? How has God invited us in to use these things? Because if we really believe that every good gift that we have if we really believe that everything we have is not because of our own power and authority, but instead God gave it to us, can God trust us with what he's given us, and can God trust us with more? Can God trust us as a resource for his giftedness to the rest of the world? Of course, you see this picture all the way through the Bible, a picture of generosity all the way back to Genesis 12, with Abraham is blessed to be a blessing. And so as God pours into Abraham, can he trust Abraham that when he pours into him, it's going to actually be distributed to the rest of the world, that kind of thing. And how about with us? If he's trusted us with a little, can he trust us with more? Can God trust us? Is there good return on investment? In business, some of you probably have heard that term, ROI. How's the ROI? What's the return on investment? If we invest something in something, do we get a good return? Well, when God invests in you, does he get a good return on that investment? And maybe a bigger question is, is when God invests in this church, Renew Community Church, in Cabot, Arkansas, does he get a good return? Do we utilize the things that God has given us well and share them with the rest of the world. This idea is an idea called stewardship. 
stewardship. Now, let me say, stewardship is a churchy word, but it's not exclusively a churchy word. Stewardship is something that you might hear about from time to time, and all it simply means is to be a good manager of something. If you're a good steward, you're a good manager of what someone else actually owns. So, for instance, if you were to borrow somebody's car, hopefully you're a good steward of the car. That when you borrow the car, you don't uh, burn holes in the seats and spill McDonald's french fries and grind them into the carpet. You know, that kind of thing. Hopefully you borrow the car and you give the car back to them in working order. Yes? Or how about someone's kids? Are you good stewards of someone else's children? We had one of our, son, one of our kids invited a friend over. He spent the night with us a couple nights ago. Was I a good steward of that kid in my home? Did we treat them well? Did we feed them? Did they make sure they took a bath? And those kinds of things. And sent them home in good shape. Or were we good stewards with that kid? Or how about the campground? We just got back from camp. Some of us are still recuperating because when I got over 40 years old, after sleeping just a couple nights on a piece of plywood with a foam core, I, it takes me two weeks to recuperate. I'm still not there yet. In fact, I'm still in a bad mood. So get out of my way. I'm just kidding. No, I'm really not. I'm just, oh, okay. But, you know, when those moments when you rent a campground to have a youth camp, are you good stewards of the campground? We don't own the campground. We're simply managing the campground for somebody else that actually owns it. Are we good stewards? Are we good managers of what someone else has? And so if so, do we actually believe that what we have is what God's given us? Do we actually believe that God is the owner and that we are just the managers of these things? Do we actually believe that every good thing that we have is because of God? James 1.17 says this, by the way. James 1.17 makes it very clear that every good gift and every perfect gift is from above. Every good thing you have in your life is because God has given it to you. That means you are not an owner, though. It means you're a steward. God actually owns it all. That means for me that my house, my car, my money, my bank account, everything that I have, including my children and my wife, I am merely a steward of. They're God's. How do I handle them? Do I handle them well? Am I a good steward and manager of what I already have? And even on a more personal note, this church, I don't own this church. This is Jesus' church. But am I a good steward of this? Am I a good steward even of my time, the time that we take together in this moment? Are we good stewards of those things? And I think this is a question every one of us has to ask individually. But again, I think from time to time, we need to ask it as a church and say, are we good stewards? Are we utilizing what God has given us well? Can he trust us with more? Because God is interested in what Christ's followers do with the resources we have in everything. God cares how we use our resources. And again, that's not just money. It's a time issue. It's a talent issue. God's concerned with how we use the things that he's given us. Now, a lot of people think, well, I give a few bucks to the church. They can do whatever they want to with it, but the rest is mine. I can do whatever I want to with it. Is that true? Is that biblical? And the answer is no. God cares about all of it. God cares how we use the resources that we have in every way. And God wants us to honor him with everything that we have, 100%. Proverbs 3, 9 says, honor the Lord with your wealth and with the first fruits of your produce. Now, what's first fruits? That's an interesting term. It's not usually something we use in this day and time. So we look back at ancient Israel, the Old Testament, God followers. These are the people that gave God their first fruits, the firstborn of their flocks. They gave him the best of their crops. He did, they did not give God their dead, almost dead, worst wimpy animals and produce that was not the idea whatsoever they were dedicated to god and they wanted to take these things and dedicate them to god And you see an example of that in numbers chapter 28 verse 26 but they understood that they needed to give god their very best they understood that god was the owner that every possession they had actually belonged to him and that they were simply stewards and managers over it over everything land over their animals over their mills their carts their looms their boats their homes everything was ultimately his, and so to them, honoring God with their first fruits, with the very best that they had, with all of their possessions, it went far beyond just a few bucks in some offering plate or an end-of-the-year gift that you get a tax deduction for. God had a much bigger picture of that in honoring him with everything, that every good thing that we have, every gift we've obtained is actually his on loan to us, and that we are simply stewards of those things. According to Proverbs 3.10, the outcome of that lifestyle, by the way, is blessing. The outcome of that lifestyle is prosperity. 
Now, so what is it? Well, out of verse 9, which we just talked about, verse 9 is, honor the Lord with your wealth. And the outcome of that is verse 10, your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will be bursting with wine. Here's the thing, that there is prosperity for those who really trust God with all the resources. Although, let me just tell you, a lot of bad theology has come out of that idea. Let me just first of all say that Proverbs are not absolute promises. Proverbs instead are observations of how life works. And so people that are good managers of the things that they have, they often have more. Because they're good managers of those things, they don't throw them away. But the prosperity out of this comes from, yes, it is true that God will provide more. Because for those he can trust with a little, he knows he can trust with more. But it is not always a cash thing. It doesn't mean what the TV preachers say. If you'll just give 10 bucks, plant some seed money, you'll get 100 bucks in the mailbox. That is just not true. It's not how God works. He's not a magic genie that we can trick into giving us what we really want. Our motives need to be pure that says everything's his anyway. If he wants it all, he can have it all because he owns it. I'm merely a steward. This is the way that our brains have to think. That we have to come to this place. But there's still truth in all that, that God does want to trust us with more. The question is, can we be trusted with what we already have? And we see all kinds of passages in Scripture, by the way, like Matthew chapter 25 is a parable of the talents. You've no doubt heard this story before. We've talked about it here before. I'm not going to preach that whole thing. It's really a standalone message by itself and needs to be. But we see in Matthew chapter 25, we see that this master is going, Jesus is telling a story, a parable. He says there's a master, he's going to go basically out of town, and he leaves some of his servants in charge of his things. He gives one servant five talents. Now, we could define that in different ways. For our purposes today, we could just say it's five sums of money, but it's more than that. I think it's time, treasures, and talents. It's all these things together. And so he gives them five things. The next one, he gives two things. The next one, he gives one. Well, when he's gone, what do they do with those things? How do they handle the owner's resources? Are they good stewards of them? The guy that had five ends up investing it and ends up with five more. So he has ten. The guy that had two ends up with two more. He has four, but the guy that had one, he buries it in the dirt because he's afraid he might mess it up. The truth is the ones that were able to take the owner's resources and use them well to be good stewards What they heard was, well done, good and faithful servant. Now I can trust you with more. That God knows that he can trust us with more. When we utilize the resources that he's given us on loan, he can trust us that we will continue to be good stewards. You see other places like in Luke chapter 16. If you've got a Bible, maybe you could follow along with me. If you need a Bible, there's some back on the sound booth wall. Luke chapter 16, verses 10 through 13, here's what it says. One who is faithful in a very little is also faithful in much. And one who is dishonest in very little is also dishonest in much. If then you have not been faithful in the unrighteous wealth, that's the wealth of the world, who will entrust you to the true riches? And if you have not been faithful in that which is another's, who will give you that which is your own? No servant can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. It's simply this whole idea of, can God trust us? Do we understand that everything we have is his anyway? That it's on loan, and we're called to be good stewards of the resources that he's given us. Time, talents, and treasures, all of it. And can he trust us with more? This is always a big question for every one of us. And so, the question really is, is God Lord in that area of our life? Is he Lord in every area? Is he king? This is what we ask you about. When we conclude services, often we're asking, are you ready to make Jesus Lord? That means he gets the say over your life. Are we ready to really do that? Are we really ready to walk in that? Are we willing to honor him with every bit of my life, including my literal life? Am I willing to honor him with that? Am I trustworthy in what I have? Would I be trustworthy with more? Can I, can I not be trusted with more? Because I know how, what I will do. Are we good stewards? And as hard as it is to talk about topics like this, we have to ask it. Partly just because it's in the Bible. And we need to be able to teach the whole counsel of God. But God has a lot to say on the topic. And we as a church need to be able to be accountable to this as well. It's not just an individual thing. It's us as a church. How do we utilize the resources that God has given us? So today what I want to do is lay out for you that. I want to show you how Renew uses the resources that come in through the offering on a weekly basis. I'm going to do this by showing you basically how we spent all the money in 2015 and lay it out for you because ultimately what I want to say to you is I could never expect you to be a good steward if the church itself is not a good steward. 
that we need to be good stewards. This is ultimately God's whole thing. And so we want to be good stewards of it. So I want to lay it out for you. So the first slide then is this. Uh, we have, uh, now this is a lot of detail. I'm going to work through these pretty quickly because we don't want to be here all day. But what you basically see in here is this 26. This is the amount of giving that's typical in an established church. So we have lots of established churches in town. And so on average, and we've even checked some of these numbers, it's about right. On average, an established church, everybody that walks in the door that day, they average about $26 per person that's in the building. That would include children and everybody. So that would mean a family of four would typically give about $104 on a weekly basis. That would be an average. Some would do less, some would do more, but it would average out to about $26 per person in the room. Renews about $16, which, by the way, is about normal for a church plant. We started out at 11, so we've made some strides, and that's good news, uh, five years ago when we launched. But here's what's hard to understand. We have an infrastructure here at Renew that looks like an established church. We have a numerical body of believers and seekers at Renew that looks like an established church. Most of the church plants that I work with and help coach, they're most of the time far, 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 far smaller, like 100 people or less. And so there's a totally different infrastructure, but the infrastructure of Renew looks like it's been around for 10 or 15 years when, in fact, we're just about to celebrate our five-year anniversary, September 10th and 11th. Put it on your calendar. Don't miss that weekend, right? Everybody's with me on that. So we get to celebrate that, but we look like an established church, but for an established church, every dollar that an established church has, we have about 60 cents. That's just what, how it breaks down. We have about 60 cents on the dollar. The next slide. Now, this is how giving is done by method. Oftentimes, if you're newer to church, time of collection is a little stressful. It's burdensome for many because if you're a seeker, let me just say, you're not expected to give here. If, you're not, if you haven't devoted your life to Christ, of course, you could give if you wanted to, but you're not expected to. There's no pressure there. But if you are a believer, the Lord has asked you and me to give him our first fruits. It is a biblical principle that you just have to see in all of that. But let me just tell you on this chart, the blue and the orange section here basically represents the fact that we have a relatively small number of families that um, are committed tithers or are regular givers here at Renew out of all the people. Now, the research would tell us that only about 2% uh, of a person's income is given to church uh, Christians, only about 2%, not, not anywhere close to 10% of a tithe. Most of the time, it's about 2%. And in fact, the reality is, the statistics would tell us that only about 15% of Christians actually tithe. And it's a pretty low number. Um, but for us, when we start to look at these things, we have a group that gives occasionally. And we start to see that in here. Uh, when you look at the chart, you see that people that are giving in the blue and the orange, those are typically giving online or writing checks or um, doing the text to give thing that hopefully you've seen and, and we'll continue to talk about. Those are great ways to expand that giving, by the way, because it's a more consistent way. If you forget the checkbook, you're not out of luck there. But all of that giving combines to about 93% of what comes in. 7% comes in basically probably from people that barely give anything or just whatever money's in their pocket at the time. Now, let me just tell you, we're not trying to throw that out. It's an important part because we couldn't throw away 7% of our budget and still function well. And so it's an important part. But hopefully what happens as people grow and mature, because what this reveals is not just about money, but it reveals something about spiritual maturity. And as we grow spiritually, we begin to understand the, the desire, and it's not uh, something we are mad about. I'm not angry at the time of offering, but I'm thrilled to be able to offer and to give God back what he already has. And so that's hopefully what happens as we mature and we grow spiritually. The good news for us is that it has grown over time. In the five years that we've been around, we've grown really well. But we have more room to grow, and that's exciting as well. But every, if everyone at Renew that called Renew home, if they really understood what obedience to Christ looked like in all of us, that is not just a money thing, but in our time and our talents, it would change everything. It would impact the city in a dramatic way. All right, the next slide. So now that we've talked about a high-level concept of giving and how Renew gives, I want to walk you through how we spend each dollar. Again, this will be from 2015 because it's easier, although 2016 will be similar, although we'll do this again in a year and we'll lay that out for you. So the next slide is this. So we're going to represent it by a dollar and how each dollar it gets broken down. So the first one is church planting. We put a dime in for every dollar that comes in through the offering. 
10 cents goes in. Now, out of, we've always done this from the very beginning of time, and we do this because we believe that planting churches is the best way to reach people that are far from God. Um, their research is very clear that that's true. We've experienced that here at Renew as well, and we want to invest in that. We think this is part of what God has called us to be, is a church planting church. But we also think that tithing is a biblical principle. Of course, the Old Testament lays it out in great detail, but Jesus himself clearly endorses it in Matthew chapter 5 and in other places, that it's still something that we strive for. At least for the Dunlap family, it's a place that we start. We don't want to get barely to 10%. We want to give there and then beyond that in offerings because we understand that everything is God's and we want to continue to grow in that area even in our own personal lives. But that's why we continue to do it. So again, we wouldn't, it wouldn't make sen sense whatsoever to talk about having uh, tithes and do that if we as a church didn't do it. So this is one way that we do that and we invest that money in church plants. So a couple of examples of things that we did in 2015 for instance, uh, we helped to plant a church in Austin, Texas, and we sent them a check for $25,000. That's amazing. And they were able to use that to reach lost people, and they're baptizing people all the time, and amazing things are happening in that church, and that's exciting, and they wouldn't have been able to do it without that kind of financial gift. Does that make sense? In 2015, we were able to help buy some chairs for an international-style type mission that's focused out of, out of Texas. We were able to help invest in church planters that are going through training and leadership development so that they can get ready to plant. And we even help a little bit with the organization that helped train us how to plant this church. And we help fund those events and those activities. But overall, Renew has helped to plant four churches in five years. That's beautiful. Now, I will also say this, that if you count Renew, that's five churches in five years. And that's very exciting to me. I don't know if it is to you. It, apparently, it's not. <laughs> five churches in five years. Now, let me also tell you that we have, in that church plant account, $50,000 to be able to plant the next church. It will likely be John as we send him out in 2017. But wouldn't it be great to send him with 100000 because let me just tell you, it takes 150000 to plant a church. But if we could invest that money to continue to do it, that's what it looks like. And here, let me also say this. I want to be honest and tell you, there have been times along the way that we could have used that $50,000 to do stuff here. Like, for instance, when uh, the uh, pipes under the floor in the building next door decided to explode, and there was a fountain coming out of the, out of the floor um, that was flooding the entire, it would have been great to say, hey, we've got 50 grand tucked away, we're just going to use that to fix that right now. Or to fix our parking lot. Or if you had come here for a service, some of the things that we had buckets around the room to catch the rain that was coming inside while we were doing that. That's just how it goes. We're in a giant metal building. It leaks. That's how we do things around here. It's okay. At least we don't have drop ceilings. Someone said that to me earlier. Drop ceilings. They'd all be wet. It'd be nasty. At least we don't have that problem. But here's the deal. We believe that this is what God's called us to, and we don't want to rob God of that and use it for something else. And I truly believe God has blessed us all along and is always taking care of the things that we need. And he, this is how he works in our individual lives as well. All right, next slide, suburban missions. As we started out, we used benevolence dollars to help wherever we could, to take care of the needs either from the church uh, environment with the people that were here or out in the community. But as that vision began to grow and God provided more, even though he'd trust us with a little, and that would be this building, he gave us the rest of the building next door, and we've been able to invest in that, which we've used for all kinds of things with disaster relief, feeding hungry people, even with our Awana kids, and all of those things that also support our big serves, which, by the way, today is a fifth Sunday. We would normally do big serve today, but because of the missions team, which are probably watching online right now because they got stranded in New York, ouch, but they will get eventually to the Dominican. I'm confident of it. But we will do our big serve in a couple of weeks, still three services and all that. But these are the things that we've been able to help invest in to help the children and help the people of this community. Speaking of kids... One of the things that we need to get off the ground is our Boys and Girls Club because it will reach hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of children in this community and that community center is a part of what we invest in now so that we can get there eventually and do those kinds of things. I hope you see something amazing though in this and that is for a four, almost five year old church, we invest 27% of what comes in to go out, to go and share things with other people in this community and other people in other communities, 27% of what comes in goes back out. 
Very few churches would ever do such a thing. Most of what comes in, we use it internally to support ourselves. But we push 27% out. And I will tell you, my goal someday would be 50% of what comes in goes out. That this is how we reach out into the communities. How we show the world that the church is not about building just another building that we can come and hide in. But instead, this is a mission station that we're deployed from. And so it would be great to continue to grow in that area. The next slide. While most of us, while most of what we do um, is focused on church life around here, like when we're together, the category is really for those kinds of things that specifically support church life. So when we go and have a Christmas party, or we do some of our fall fests or movie nights, things like that, also things you might not always think of, like communion cups, those actually do cost something. And the juice that actually goes in it, we actually do have to buy juice. We don't make that. Um, believe it or not, I know you're surprised, um, but we actually have to buy those things, and we spend a, just a very small amount of money to support those kinds of inner workings. We're very careful with our budget. The next slide. Most of our ministries are self-funded. So, for instance, we just got back from summer camp. We have to charge families for the kids to go to camp that covers the cost of food and T-shirts and all the stuff that goes on there, including renting a campground. But for other ministries, it wouldn't make sense. So like for Vacation Bible School, we don't charge families for VBS. We might for a t-shirt, but we don't charge them for Vacation Bible School. But still, we invest a very small amount of money in order to do it because our teams are incredibly talented and um, gifted at figuring out how to do things cheap. And that's good. So we don't throw money away there. We invest some, but it's not a lot. But let me just say, wouldn't it be nice if no one ever had to pay for summer camp? I don't know about you, but I would love it if we could send 200 kids to summer camp every summer and they would never have to pay a dime. If you think that's good, we can do it. But we have to get behind it and say, this is a core value for this church. That we're going to send 200 kids to camp and money will never be a barrier. Vacation Bible school will never be a barrier. Money will never stand in the way. We will do the things that we need to do in order to plant seeds of faith in these kids' hearts and lives for eternity at summer camp. We want to do that. I think it would be a worthwhile thing, but we have to collectively believe that that's important to us. The next slide. So the amount that we spend for staff uh, is fairly typical for a church our size, including um, this 38%. Now, I would say that a goal for us would be about 35%, although I will tell you that most church plants... It's 50%. Most church plants, 50% of what comes in goes actually to staff salaries. But let me just tell you that this only shows you a part of the picture of how this is used because we have fewer dollars coming in because of that. Then that money is smaller that we have to work with for a church this size. Uh, we are highly understaffed, really, for a church as big as what Renew is. But we do have several staff people that spend hours and hours and hours every week that are 100% volunteers. They don't take a dime from this place. We have others that take very reduced salaries or part-time salaries. Some of them even fundraise for their own salaries in order to be able to have an income. But ultimately, at the end of the day, uh, we don't have a single person on this staff. And we have several in various capacities between full-time, part-time, and volunteer. Uh, we don't have a single person on this staff making what would be considered a market wage if they were either to go into industry or even to an established church. Not a single person. Um, so what does that mean? Well, it means that we, you have a staff of people who choose to serve here, not for the money, but because they love God and they love you. And they want to do what God's called them to do, to be good stewards of what they've been given in time and talents and also in treasure. Next slide. So these are the costs associated with operating um, the church. Everything from toilet paper and soap to computers and our website, things like that. These are totally unglamorous things that most people never even think about, but they are things you have to invest some money in because my guess is that no one here wants a BYOTP system. I'm just guessing. Uh, anyone in here just really feel drawn to carry your own toilet paper, go for it, um, because we spend a lot of money on toilet paper. Not sure why that is, but that's how it goes. we got a bunch of people that like to use that toilet paper and flush toilets that shouldn't be flushed. The men's room's got a little issue, but we'll fix it later. It's okay, but you might consider waiting until you get home to use it. Anyway, but that, that's the thing. But bring your own toilet paper. We're going to try not to do it, so we need to still continue to invest in things like that, and that's how we use some of that money. The next slide, these are the expenses associated with the worship center, the facility that you're in right now, this whole building. Um, that includes our mortgage payment, our utilities, our insurance costs, 
And some of those costs that are associated with the worship center are offset a little bit by another ministry, which I'll explain here in just a few minutes. But just like your monthly household budget has bills, we have bills that come every month that we have to pay faithfully, whether the money is there or not. We have to find a way to pay those things. And so, for instance, our mortgage payment on this building is $4,302. Now, you may gasp at that, but let me just tell you, in the grand scheme of things, it's pretty cheap. The reality is we have 16,000 square feet that's usable in some way. Some of that's storage, but on this side of the building, about 16,000 square feet. So if you were to break that down into a household budget for a 2,000 square foot home, which many of you would live on either side of that, that would be the equivalent of spending $537 a month for a mortgage payment. That's pretty reasonable. Probably very few people in here that have a 2,000 square foot home would have a payment that low, 537. But that's the way it would break down for us. And so we have a very reasonable mortgage cost. And I'm going to talk about that a little bit later because the only reason we're in this building is because there's a Christian lending organization that decided to invest in us when we were a year and a half old and no bank in the world would have touched us because we didn't have five years of giving history and all that stuff. But they helped us out, and they gave us the ability to come into this building in a reasonable way. Uh, but our monthly uh, insurance is $850, and our average electricity bill is just over 1000 bucks every month. It peaked in August of 2015. It was almost $2,000. And even though, again, that may make you gasp, it's still, when you think about how much space this is, it's not that unusual. My electricity bill in my house last month was about $360. I did throw up in my mouth just a little bit when I opened the envelope. Um, but still, in the grand scheme of things, uh, even a $2,000 electricity bill for 16,000 square feet is not that bad. And so I will also tell you that we have a huge blessing that I want to tell you about. And so uh, several months ago, really even into last year, began to pray that God would provide a way for us to have some financial resources to do some work on this building. Because the truth is, what comes in, we're, it, t it takes us, the money that comes in, we spend it uh, on things like $4,000 mortgage and all the things that you've seen laid out here today. Um, the money all has a place that it goes. And so I began praying, God, would you provide something for us so we can do some of the work that needs to be done so our roof doesn't leak when it rains and so people don't trip on rocks in the parking lot and things like that. And so I got a phone call out of nowhere, which is the way that God usually does stuff. And so I got a phone call from the mayor of Cabot who said, we'd like to build, buy a couple of acres from you, and um, here's what we're willing to offer. And I laughed at him, and I said no, and I didn't call the mayor back. That's a true story. And so um, I told him it was just too ridiculous. And so he came back to us and said, well, what if we did this? And ultimately the offer was really good, and they offered us $200,000 for a couple of acres of land out here at Renew. And we said yes, because we believe that was really what God, was, how he was answering our prayer. And so that money didn't go into our bank account. Actually, it went right to our mortgage holder. We never even touched the money, but it reduced the balance of our mortgage. But also, they were kind enough to say, but if you really want to fix your roof, we'll let you draw some of that money out and be able to do some of those repairs. And so guess what? Here in the next couple of months, we've got a contractor that's going to fix the roof because that way we don't have to have our offering buckets to catch rain in next time. Does that make sense? And so we're going to be able to fix some of the parking lot and build a, a walkway out this back door to go into the community center and some of those kinds of things. God has blessed us with that, and it's beautiful. One of the things that we're going to fix in the next couple months is our air conditioning. Now, when I said this in the first service, they were rattling like crazy, and you couldn't even hardly hear, at least I couldn't. But you hear a little rattle now, yes? We'll be able to fix most of that with some duct work and that because the, we were ha had to do this as cheaply as possible when we moved in. But God's provided a way for us to do some things so you're not 68 degrees here and 78 degrees in the back. To be able to balance that out, change the noise, make it more efficient. Now, the next slide is our daycare. Now, some of you may not realize this, but we have a, a daycare here that is a full-time daycare. We have about 60 kids during the week, even more so during the summertime. And that also, when we opened up the daycare, which we did when we launched this building a little more than three years ago, which was crazy to start a daycare while you were opening a new building, probably would not do that again. But it worked okay, and here we are three years later, and that's great. But we also were able to have... Uh, we're able to create 15 paid positions in the city. So we're able to help um, with contributing to the economy in our city with that kind of thing. But the daycare also contributes about 6% uh, on uh, the offering and tithe that we have. 
that helps to offset some of our bills, about a 6% match on what comes in, and that's beautiful. That helps us a lot. And then we also have some outside funding that contributes about 5% of a match on what comes in, and that comes from mostly people fundraising for their income that are on staff that are uh, part-time and raising money, but also from time to time we have some Renew people that love Renew that move or go, uh, that have to go out of the country or whatever and, or out of the state, and they still continue to send money in or just friends of Renew that love the mission that we're on. And they continue to support it. All right, the last slide is this. Now, this is just an overall summary. We've had some great successes, and we still have some challenges. Successes, we have overall weekly giving that has improved year after year after year. We continue to put 10% aside to invest in church planting, and we'll continue to do it. And we have an established emergency fund, which is about two weeks of giving. That's great to have a little emergency fund, because that way, when an air conditioning unit explodes, we could actually pay to have it fixed. Because most of us, when it's 187 degrees in Arkansas, we probably want air conditioning. Amen? You're still with me, right? So we have a little emergency fund to be able to take care of things like that. Now, again, this would be equivalent to you and your home budget of having two weeks of income. So it's not a lot, but hopefully it's something that will continue to grow, and we can continue to develop that, and that's good. But uh, challenges, while giving has improved, we continue to operate substantially less than an established church. Now, again, we're in the ballpark of what an, a church plant is. But it's also an opportunity for us to grow. Outside funding helps with some of those things a lot. So based on what you see, based on what I've laid out for you, let me ask you, do you think God can trust Renew with more? Are we utilizing the resources well that God has given us? And the other question is, can you trust Renew with more? So what would change at Renew if God decided to do that? If God opened up the floodgates of financial blessings, which ultimately there's no other solution to that other than the people of Renew go, okay, I'm in, I want to do this. Let me just say an example would be, and that was that one of the first slides, if we're averaging $16, that means a family of four, in a weekly basis would give about $64, but an established church, that same family of four at $26, would, $26 per head would be about $104. That $40 difference in one family on a weekly basis makes a dramatic impact here. It allows us to do things that we have never been able to do, um, but ultimately the question is, can God trust us with more? That's ultimately what we're trying to convey, is are we good stewards to be able to handle that kind of thing? But ultimately the goal would be for everyone that calls Renew Home, which would be about 900 people probably, and that would include children. If everyone that called Renew Home would give consistently and weekly, it would change everything. So for instance, if you had 900 times 26, that's $23,400 a week which is um, significantly more than what comes in, which allows us to continue to do the things that he's called us to do and then some. So what would we do right now if the money was here? If the money were already available, well, we'd fix the roof, the air conditioner, and the, and the parking lot, which God's already provided for, and we're in the beginning stages of that. I think one of the things that we would do is build a big playground for our kids. I think that would be fair and good, don't you think? Although I did have someone come up to me after first service and say, hey, did you know that my uncle owns a company where they build all this playground equipment for kids? I'll call him. And I went, you do that. That's great. Donations are perfect. We'll take all that free stuff, although that's probably not a reality. I think it'd be great to pay off our building in the next one or two years. What do you think? Do you think it would be good to pay off a building like that and then be able to prepare for the next season of ministry of growth in whatever it is that God calls us to? Maybe it's expanding a worship center and expanding this where we can have more people that can come and hear the good news of Christ. Maybe that's part of what we're doing. But maybe it's building more classrooms so we can launch a Boys and Girls Club. And we need to build those classrooms and more bathrooms next door. Maybe it's to hire a couple of our volunteer ministry staff so we can pay them a wage and they can support their families. Or plant more churches to continue to plant a church. Ten years from now, I want to stand here in front of you and say, we've planted a church every year for the last 15 years. Wouldn't that be exciting? To continue to plant churches because this is the way that you reach lost people. And then reach lost people more effectively than ever before. I have a dream of a little ministry I want to start. You want to hear about it really quick? Here it is. I want to have a Friday night movie night ministry. We already have the big screen. We already have a sound system. I'd love to have a little trailer, and we have a team of people to put that movie screen in the trailer, a couple of bounce houses. One of you say you can use my driveway and front yard on a Friday night. We roll up there into your driveway in your front yard. We go and tell all your neighbors about it with door hangers the week before that. They all come. They sit on your front lawn to watch a movie, and we, their kids play in the bounce houses, and we tell them about Jesus while we're there. 
That would be an amazing thing. In other words, we don't wait for everyone to come into this building. We take the message of Christ to our communities, neighborhood by neighborhood by neighborhood, as you partner with us, and we send a team of people that know how to do it, and they go in and do it, and they partner with you, and all you got to do is provide the house. That would be amazing. Those are the kinds of things that we can do as God provides the resources to do it. Of course, that also takes time, and it takes some talents, but it takes treasure. But I also want to tell you, I think we can end hunger in the city. And we need to end hunger in the city. There's absolutely no reason any kid should go to bed hungry in this entire city. We could solve that. But just like we want to send our kids to camp without making them pay for it, we have to want to end hunger in the city. And that's spiritual hunger and physical hunger. We can do that. God can use us to do those things. But can he entrust us with the resources to go and do it? And so why is this so important? Well, it may surprise you that God talks more about money and giving and generosity than any other topic in the Bible other than himself. You see things like the word believe 272 times talked about in the Bible. Or how about the word love, 371, pray, 714, give her money, 2,162 times. That's a lot. Why in the world would God talk about money so much? I think it's simple. It's because this is an area that we struggle with the most. Just like today, it's a struggle to even hear about it. Why? Because it gets to the heart of what is so challenging for many of us in talking about it. Because money has the ability to bring out the worst in people. Also the best in people, though. But it becomes such an area of affection and even worship for us at times. And so people hate talking about it. But the truth is, if we're to teach the whole counsel of God at least once or twice a year, it's good to come back to it and say, God's serious about honoring him with what we have. Stewardship is more than money, though. Stewardship's about time, talents, and treasures. God is the, ability, give, God is the one who gives us the ability to obtain wealth in the first place. Deuteronomy chapter 8, 18 makes it clear. But there are lots of things to be good stewards of. Leadership is a good stewardship thing, to be able to pass on that leadership. Dominion over things is a stewardship thing. Wisdom is a stewardship, stewardship thing. Even the message of Christ that many of you believe and have followed is a stewardship thing. That God has entrusted you with a message to share. But he has ultimately entrusted every one of us with great gifts. We're not the owners, though. We're only the manager. Psalm 24, 1 through 2 says... The earth is the Lord's and everything in it. The world and all of its people belong to him. For he laid the earth's foundation on the seas and built it on the ocean depths. You know what? Owners have rights. Stewards have responsibilities. And we have a responsibility to God for the things that he's given us individually and as a church. And one day, I want to hear, well done, good and faithful servant. And I want you to hear that too. It's not just a money thing. It's a living our life for Christ thing. Well done, good and faithful servant. So where do we go from here? What do we do with this? I would just ask you to, number one, at the very least, pray that God will provide in abundance for this ministry and the work that we want to do. God has provided what we need, and God has always provided. None of us have gone hungry. But God can do more, and if we're trustworthy, we would ask him that he would trust us with it so we can go and reach more people for Christ. So at least pray for that. But I would say other things, like give regularly. Make it a consistent habit to give whether you're here or not. That would be one of the greatest earth-changing things around for any church, is that you would stop seeing church as a club that you pay a cover charge to when you show up at the door. It's not that. It is about entrusting God with what you've been given, and to give regularly, whether you're here or not. Again, that's one of the ways we have text to give and some of those tools that make that super easy to do. Plan ahead. Maybe you even put church in your budget. Most people don't. The research is clear about that. Begin now, even if it's $10, to say, I'm going to begin trusting God and work to the area that I need to be going and growing in. But give by faith and trust. Trust that God has got this, and quit being afraid we spent a lot of time over the last couple of months about talking about not being afraid. But if you will trust God and give him your very best, he will take care of your needs always. This is an absolute promise. He may not always give you what you want, but if you seek the kingdom of God first, everything else you need will be in check. And that's the last thing I'll say is check your attitude. Don't let the devil lie to you and tell you, they just want my money. That's not what this is about. This is about living a life of stewardship with our time, with our talents, 
our treasures, the whole person, is trusting God with all of it, to live a surrendered life. So check your attitude. It's not just about what you give, it's how. Can I give with a cheerful heart my time? Can I give with a cheerful heart my talents? Can I give with a cheerful heart my treasures? And here's the last thing. Even we, even we are the Lord's. Romans 14, 8 says it clearly. We've been paid for by the blood of Christ. 1 Peter 1, 19 says that clearly. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 through 20 says, Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God, a gift from God? You are not your own, for you were bought with a price, so glorify God in your body. You see, ultimately, everything that we have, we are simply stewards of, including our own lives. That we are God's. If you're a Christ follower, Christ has purchased you. Will I be a good steward of my entire life? But let me just say, if you're not a Christ follower, today's your day. Today's a day to surrender and go, but I want all that Christ has for me and wants to do with me. For the rest of us, it's a message of surrender always. God, I will go anywhere. I will do anything. I'm all yours. Use me how you see fit. This is the life of a steward that says, I will trust God because ultimately at the end of the day, God has given us an indescribable gift. That's how Paul explains Jesus. That Jesus is an indescribable gift. The fact that he died for you so that you could live is an indescribable gift. Grace, mercy, hope, forgiveness is an indescribable gift. Let's be good stewards of that in our life, individually and as a church. So Jordan's going to play for just a couple minutes. Let me invite you to stay right where you are and pray. Ask God to help you to see these things. Help him, ask him to help you become a great steward of your time, your talents, your treasures. And stand and worship. And let's worship together. And then we'll come back and we'll finish up with just one thing. But let's take just a couple minutes to pray, to reflect, and to worship. And then we'll come back and we'll finish. These have passed away. Your law has stayed the same. And your constant
Father, let that not just be words of a catchy song. Help our love for you to grow and grow. As we get to know you and know your heart, know what you've called us to be and to become, help our response to be love, thanksgiving, following, walking worthy of the calling you've given us. So, Father, we thank you for what you've done. Thank you for your word that teaches us. And even in areas we don't understand, maybe don't even like, pray that we can be surrendered and honor you anyway. Trust you. That you know best. So we thank you for what you've done and what you still are yet to do. It's in the name of Jesus that we pray. Amen. Well, we're going to take up an offering and um, I, probably nothing else I need to say about it. Uh, I think we've covered that ground, so I'm going to just pray for our offering, and then they'll come by and they'll take it up, and then I want to introduce you to a friend and to say just a couple last things, and uh, we'll be done for the day. Father, thank you for this offering. Thank you for the financial provision you've given us. You have always taken care of us since day one, and I pray that you have entrusted us with these things so that we can be faithful servants and stewards, and that we will continue to be faithful with what you've given us individually and as a church. Help us to grow as stewards of managers of your resources. We thank you for this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, they'll come through. So let me introduce you. This is a friend of mine. His name's Lynn Ragsdale. Everybody clap for him because he's up here on stage. So Lynn is with an organization called the Sol Solomon Group, Sol Solomon Foundation. Um, basically, the story is, you know, we had launched in basically the bowling alley. We were there for a couple of weeks, uh, five years ago. And then uh, we ended up over in a little building that was a church that had merged with another one. And then our fourth week in existence, we ended up in the strip mall down here over by Larry's Pizza. And we grew and grew. We outgrew it immediately. We took the next space. We outgrew it. We went to another service, outgrew it. And the bank wouldn't let us take more space in the strip mall. And so I would literally get in my car and drive around town going, okay, God, I need a building. I need ten to 12,000 square feet with a sprinkler system and lots of parking. I think praying specifically is good. And so I was praying this prayer, kept driving by this building, and uh, kept getting prompted, you need to call, you need to call, you need to call. I finally call the owner. He gets on the phone. I said, hi, my name is Spencer Dunlap. I'm with Renew, looking for ten to 12,000 square feet. I don't suppose in that big giant building, which is about 70,000 square feet, I don't suppose you would have ten to 12,000 square feet you'd be interested in having a church in. And he said, yes, do you want to see it? And so I threw up a little bit again, and I, I may have a heidel hernia or something. I don't know. But I, I, uh, and so I came over, and this is the room he showed me. And there were a couple old cars, old classic cars in here, and a couple boats. And they used it as their storage for their toys, uh, all these guys that worked in the airbag factory that was next door. And uh, so we worked out a deal, and we had raised about $100,000 at this point because I had been calling churches uh, and friends that had money and saying, hey, we're going to have to build a building or something. I need money. Would you send me money? And we had about $100,000 tucked away to be able to do build out. Now, Lynn would tell you 100000 is not enough to build out a building this big, but it was a good step in the right direction. And so, um, so basically, I was at a conference, and I met a guy named Doug Crozier, who actually is the CEO of Solomon Foundation. And I met him at this event, and uh, he said, I've heard about Renew, I've heard your story, I want you to tell it to me at lunch. So we had lunch, we told him the story, and he said, don't lease the building, buy it. And I went, I laughed at Doug, and I said, well, no one's going to lend us money, uh, because we're like a year and a half old church, and no one lends money to a year and a half old church, so that's not possible. And he said, you don't worry about that, you leave that up to me, I'll make it happen. And so he said, you go ask the guy if he'll sell you the building. Went back, said, would you sell it? He said, sure, how about $150,000? Which if you don't know, again, anything about commercial buildings, an 11,000 square foot building with an $80,000 sprinkler system is worth a little more than $150,000. But he gave it to us for $150,000. The Solomon Foundation gave us the rest of the money needed to build it out, although we did most of the work ourselves. And here we are. And so um, it's exciting to be able to have uh, have Lynn here. They came down to share the weekend. I told him what I was preaching on today, and he said, hey, my wife and I, were going to come and hang out with you. And so I wanted you to at least meet him and give him an opportunity to talk for a minute and just bring some context to what we're doing here. So He made the comment that uh, banks won't loan money to a year-and-a-half-old church. Uh, many times across the country now, they won't loan money to a 50-year-old church because <laughs> they consider uh, us a bad risk for some reason I don't understand. But since the money was loaned to this church, 
we have made more than 150 loans to churches all across America. And I have two things to tell you about those churches. Since they have got increased facilities, there are 6,000 more followers of Jesus today than there were before those churches got their improved facilities. And my banker friends have no idea what to do with this reality. We have had zero late payments and zero defaults on any loan because God's people work that way. Yes. We look at Spencer, his mission, the one that you're on together, we loan to leadership and mission. We want financials. We want them to look good. We understand that, but we believe God follows his mission through mission-minded leaders, and that's our highest component. That's why Doug said to you that many years ago, let us worry about that. We like where you're going. We like yeah. the mission. We like the fact that this town's going to be changed and more churches are going to be planted. Now, that gets us to everybody. My wife is over here, Betsy. Betsy, wave at the folks. Say hi to Betsy. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Betsy is going to be out there, and I will be too with these. It tells our story, our core values, our rate sheets. We take investments from people just like you. Pay great rates from two and a quarter percent all the way up to 4.75 percent. You can't get that anywhere. And 100 percent of your money is invested in churches just like this around the country changing lives. How many people in this room are excited about the political scene this year? Any, anybody really excited? Come on. <laughs> yeah, exactly. How many of you believe that the Republicans or Democrats or anyone has the answer to change this country? Anybody in the room believe that? Okay, we're all on the right page then. Jesus has always had the answer, will always have the answer, and the church is the only organization ever invented that can withstand all of politics and the gates of hell. And that's why we invest in the church. Now, we as an organization also tithe off of what we call profits. It's a spread in the financial world. And we give grants back to the people who are partnering with us in loans. And so with the message today, I thought I would bring a really big check. Yeah. <laughs> well, I wish it were larger in the amount, but it's a big check. And we're going to make that our gift to you to use however you want. It's $1,000, just not a part of your loan, not a part of anything. It's just a grant. Maybe it's a part of that playground. Maybe it's a part of something else you want to yeah. do to help the community. But just take this and use it however you want. And, and we enjoy helping our churches do things they wouldn't think about doing with just some, some uh, extra money. This has nothing to do with... Yeah. With a 63 Impala? No, no, nothing to do with that. No, it can't, it can't go to that. But, uh, uh, but I'd be glad to help you with that if you'd yes, like sometime yes, along yes. the way. We're you just, drove it, I think. I've driven it, yes. yes. It's wonderful. <laughs> but it is great to be with new friends and new family members. And, and as the Solomon Foundation, uh, we, we don't have a business relationship. We've got a spiritual partnership. We're on mission together to make more Christ followers. Thank you for letting us be a part of that with you. It's awesome. Thanks so much. Let's give him a hand. If you could do a closing prayer for us, that would I'd be great, to. and then we'll out the door. I'd so. love to say a blessing over you. Stand with me as we pray right now. God, we say a blessing over this church, not my blessing, not the blessing of Spencer, but it's your blessing that we covet. We ask you to make us then a blessing to your kingdom. Thank you for the mission that this church has been on. We already see down the road in our minds of what you're going to do, but we already know that any time we paint that picture, you paint it better. We know, Father, that you are able to do far more than we even imagine or dream about, and we claim that already here in Cabot, Arkansas. We pray for the church plants that will happen out of this place and because of this place. We pray that every dollar invested will multiply into people coming to become Christ followers. Thank you for the privilege of worship today. Thank you for the transparency and the openness of Scripture to teach us to be good stewards. And thank you for how we've learned that today through Spencer. Again, Father, we give you all praise, all glory, in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. I love you. Have a great day. We'll see you soon. If you have nothing better to do, you can help me take up the chairs on the two sides and stack them. You can leave the ones in the middle. Thanks so much. We'll see you out front. Bring your tired and bring your shame, bring your guilt and bring your pain, don't you know that's not your name, you will always be much more to me, and every day I wrestle with the voices that keep telling me I'm not right, but 